Hello and welcome to our program. The central theme of Scripture, as we've emphasized in this series of lessons, is Jesus. Jesus, the fact that He is the Son of God. All of the Bible points to Jesus. The Old Testament points forward to the time Jesus lived here on the earth. And the book of Revelation talks about the future return of Jesus. And the various letters of the New Testament tell us how to live in reference to Jesus. With that in mind, our lesson today is going to deal with the fact that Jesus is returning, that Jesus is coming back. We turn to Acts, the first chapter, verses 9 through 11. This is following the death of Jesus. He has been resurrected from the dead. He's talking to his apostles, and he ascends back into heaven. As we read from Acts 1, 9 through 11, Now when he had spoken these things, while they watched, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will go so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. The return of Jesus is found throughout the New Testament, the fact that he one day will return. Not only the fact that he promised here that he would return, even before he was crucified and resurrected from the dead. We read in John 14, he's telling his apostles and, uh, at the Last Supper that he would return some time. He was going to prepare a place for them, and he would return to have them be with him. We read again in Acts chapter 1, verse 11, as we've just looked at, the fact that he is returning. In 2 Peter, the third chapter, verses 1 through 9, I'd like to read these verses. 2 Peter's written probably anywhere from maybe 30 to 40 some years after uh, the re Jesus had ascended to heaven. And Jesus hadn't returned. And probably some people thought in the first century Jesus was coming back very quickly. And they were doubting the fact of his return. And so Peter reminds his readers in these nine verses, the fact that Jesus hasn't come back yet doesn't mean that he's not returning. He says, Beloved, I now write to you the second epistle, in both of which I stirred up your pure minds by ways of reminder, that you be mindful of the words spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandments of, of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days, walking according to their own lust, saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of water and in the water, by which the world that then existed perished, being flooded with water. But the heavens and the earth, which are now preserved by the same word, are reserved for fire until the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, do not forget this one thing, that with the Lord one day is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. The Lord is not slack concerning His promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. To summarize that passage very quickly, Peter says this, Just the fact that Christ has not returned yet, and this were 2,000 years following His first coming and the promise of His return, doesn't mean it's not going to happen. There were scoffers in the Old Testament before the flood happened, before the rain came. When Noah warned people of a flood, they said it would never happen, and yet it did. If God says something's going to happen, obviously it will. And God said through Jesus and his apostles, he is coming back. Also in Hebrews, the ninth chapter and verse 28, the concept that he's going to return a second time without sin unto salvation. The promise there basically saying he'll return, uh, obviously as our judge, and is he, he's, he is our king already, but he will return again and usher in eternity. Whenever we think about the return of Jesus, we would ask the question, maybe the obvious question, when will this occur? I don't know of any other religious topic that seems to generate more interest, or maybe not debate necessarily, but more interest than the return of Jesus. I can remember from the time I was a small boy, people predicting the time of Jesus' return. And even in our present day, I was reading somewhere that some religious groups said that Jesus is returning today, Wednesday, October 7th, 2015. This is just one group among probably hundreds or thousands, or at least groups or individuals, who thought they could predict the time of the return of Jesus. We simply don't know the time of his return. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 36, of that day and hour knows no man, not even the Son of Heaven. Jesus himself, when he uttered that statement, didn't know when he was returning. After telling a parable in Matthew chapter 25 about being prepared, he says in verse 13, following that parable, he says, Behold or beware, the Son of Man is coming in an hour or day in which uh, you don't know the day or hour in which the Son of Man is coming. He's referred to as a thief in the night. You know, I've heard this illustration many times. A normal thief does not break or, or call you ahead of time to say he's going to break into your house for obvious reasons. You know, we watch television shows and we read about these so-called dumb thieves, people who, 
either are just simply ignorant, not knowing what they're doing, or perhaps intoxicated or on drugs who, who break into to stores and do very silly things. I, I read a story one time of a person who robbed a bank, and they wrote the uh, robbery note on their own, uh, on one of their personal checks, <laughs> which had his phone number and address, and so it was very easy to run this, this thief down. You read stories about this, but a normal thief does not give you warning ahead of time as to when he's coming. And Jesus actually uses that illustration in the last part of Matthew chapter 24 to tell us we don't know the time of, of the return of Jesus. Just as thieves don't warn us ahead of time, so will the return of Jesus be. In Matthew 25, 1 through 13, there's a parable of the five wise and five foolish virgins. And very simply, the foolish virgins were not prepared. And the point of that parable is that we need to prepare, be prepared for the return of Jesus. They had not brought oil for their lamps, and so whenever the bridegroom returned, they were not allowed to enter into that feast. And the concept there, again, is we don't know the time, so we always need to be ready to be prepared for his return. Again, we've had many date setters over the years. I've, I've heard of so many, uh, dozens perhaps I've even been heard of or been aware. About three or four years ago, a man by the name of Harold Camping supposedly knew the time of the return of Jesus. And this wasn't the first time he predicted it. And he made big public uh, discourses concerning how he'd figured out the time of Jesus' return. It didn't happen, I believe it was in the spring of 2011. So he said, well, it's actually going to happen in November of 2011. And of course it didn't happen. And again, there's been so many down through the years. One of the most famous ones, at least in the United States, has been by the name of William Miller. He predicted the return of Jesus in 1843. It didn't happen, so he said, I got the date wrong. It's going to be 1844. And, of course, again, obviously Jesus did not come back. I get mailings in our, in our church office almost weekly from various individuals who tell us the return of Jesus is very near, and we know it's going to happen very quickly. Well, the Bible states very quickly we simply don't know. I think we need to leave it at that, the fact that Jesus is coming back. We don't know when he's going to return. But the principle we learn from Matthew 25 and elsewhere in Scripture is we need to be prepared. Having said that, what is going to happen whenever Jesus does return? Again, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding or false understanding, false teaching in, in the modern religious world as to what will occur. Many people look for some great future or millennial kingdom that's going to be established here on earth, but the Bible doesn't teach that. What do we know and what does the Bible say will occur whenever Jesus returns? First of all, there's going to be a resurrection of the dead. Jesus, speaking in John chapter 5 and verse 28, says this, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth, those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation, or the King James says the resurrection of damnation. Whenever Jesus returns, all who are dead, all who are in the graves, are going to be raised up. And again, uh, uh, obviously those who are alive will be caught up with Jesus at that time, but there will be a general resurrection of the dead uh, at that time. Second, we understand the Bible teaches the concept of a judgment. We read in Acts 17, chapter, and in verse 31, the background or context of this verse is that Paul is standing on Mars Hill, and he's trying to convict a bunch of idolaters, a bunch of Gentiles who don't believe in God, to show them from, from nature that obviously there was an all-loving, all-powerful, all-wise God who created this world. He's that unknown God that, that they referred to in Acts 17. <coughs> he also goes on to say, to move on to Jesus, to move on to the fact of Jesus' Son. And then he said the need to, to repent or live right because in verse 31 of Acts 17, because uh, he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained, he has given assurance of this to all by raising him from the dead. Notice God's going to judge the world through Jesus, and he's going to judge it in righteousness. That word righteousness is an interesting word. It's the same word as translated justice in our New Testaments. And basically it talks about it's going to be based on right or wrong. You know, we live in a corrupt world, and we read stories all the time about, about innocent people being found guilty in courts because of maybe corrupt lawyers or corrupt people, corrupt judges. We also find that it's just the opposite true. Uh, sometimes the guilty are let off and, and considered innocent because a judge or somebody's been paid off and, and, and dishonesty occurs. That happens a lot in this world. The Apostle Paul writes in 2 Timothy 4, shortly before he died, that he, that he was going to stand before a righteous judge. Paul knew what it was like to stand before unrighteous judges, dishonest judges. As a matter of fact, he basically had been held 
uh, as kidnapped in essence, uh, waiting, uh, the person who had kept him in captivity for a number of years was waiting for money to be paid for his release. Well, God's not that type of a God. God's going to judge us in righteousness, which means justly, according to his word, according to his will. When a judgment occurs, those who have submitted to Jesus are going to obviously enjoy eternal life, and those who haven't, eternal condemnation. But it's going to be based on what God has revealed in his word, as far as his word being true and accurate. And it's going to be based on justice, again, righteousness. 2 Corinthians 5.10, we're reminded that we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ to receive the things done uh, in our body according to what we have done, whether they are good or bad. So the Bible very clearly says that one day we all will stand before God in judgment. And that will occur at the return of Jesus following the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. At that point, the Bible teaches us basically that eternity then will be ushered in. We look at different passages from the Bible which, which discuss this fact. The image from Matthew 25 where in the context here, Jesus is, is telling a little story or a parable about, about two groups of people. The one group of people are the people who did not uh, practice uh, benevolence to their fellow man. They weren't kind to others. When they, when they knew people were sick, they didn't help them. If they were naked, they didn't clothe them. If they were in jail, they didn't visit them. And Jesus, in this parable, says basically, when you failed to help those who were in need, you failed to help Jesus. On the other hand, those who are on the right hand are those who did practice righteousness, those who did uh, practice benevolence concerning the, the less fortunate, and those were the ones who were going to be ushered into eternal bliss. Notice verse 4, 34 of Matthew 25. Then the king will say to those on the right hand, as opposed to the left, those who failed to help others, Come, you blessed of my Father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And again, as we look at this parable, we're reminded this is not the only standard or criterion of judgment in the Bible. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.10 says we must uh, give account for all that we have done, basically. Also, the book of Ecclesiastes ends with the fact that we're all going to have to stand before God in judgment. Therefore, as Solomon says in Ecclesiastes 12.1, Fear God and keep His commandments, uh, for this is uh, the whole duty of man, or rather Ecclesiastes 12, 13. This is the whole of man. And then he says in verse 14, because God will call every work into judgment. And so then eternity is going to be ushered in. The righteous, as we already mentioned from Matthew 25, going to eternal life, but the wicked also going to eternal punishment. Matthew 25, 46, those who failed to be benevolent or, or kind, these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. It's hard to grasp or hard to, to understand eternity when you start thinking about a spiritual realm. It's, it's a realm outside of ours. It's a dimension that is not ours. We're finite beings, and we really have difficulty. We struggle with this. But the reality is, is that God's eternal. God has always been, and He will always continue to exist. We're eternal from the standpoint that we will live on following this life. We have a beginning, so we're not eternal like God. We were created, we were produced, and we came into this world. But we will live on, and we will live on very clearly in one of two destinies. We will live on either in eternal bliss, and as we think about heaven, we think about it being a place where there's an absence of, of sin, an absence of, of heartache. You know, there are so many horrible things that go on in this world, and so Satan is, is so powerful. Uh, so many uh, destroyed lives, destroyed homes, destroyed families, and, and just in general destroyed relationships. It all gets back to Satan. Satan has destroyed so many things, and yet heaven's a place where Satan will not be, and it's a place where we'll have eternal bliss, and we'll have perfect relationships, one with another, and again, uh, the fact that we'll be with God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all those other angelic or heavenly beings. But on the other hand, uh, hell's going to be a place, obviously, of horrible punishment. Uh, the description found in Mark the ninth chapter, that where the fire is not quenched and the worm does not die a place of, of gnashing of teeth and outer darkness, uh, obviously a horrible place that no rational person would want to spend time in. With that in mind, as we think about the fact of the return of Jesus, we've already seen the fact that he promises to come back. Acts chapter 1, he promised that. Other places, the writers talk about the certain return of Jesus. Number two, about the fact that we don't know the time of his return. Uh, there are so many date setters. I've talked to so many people personally who say, you know, Jesus is coming back very quickly. I was talking to a person that's been about 10 or 15 years ago. He came into my office, and we were discussing some religious matters, and he, he basically, I think he was sincere. He was trying to be nice to me, and he said, I'm just doing this for your good, but I want you to know Jesus is coming back very quickly. 
And I said, really, how soon? He says, probably, you know, within the next few years. And, and I said, you know, how do you know that? And he started giving me all this rigmarole. And, and I said, basically, Jesus said, we don't know the time of his return. And I thanked him for his honesty, his sincerity, but I showed him from the Bible, we don't know when Jesus is coming back. And yet we still have so many people today thinking they know the time of his return. And I've always thought, what difference does it make? If we're living our lives righteously, it doesn't matter when he returns. And I think that's what God wants us to do, live our lives righteously all the time so that we're ready whenever he does return. So the fact that he will return, the promise of his coming is, is emphasized when he does return, those who are the righteous dead will be, or rather all the dead will be resurrected. The righteous living will be caught up also at that time. The judgment will occur, and of course then eternity will be ushered in. And also the world's going to be destroyed. Second Peter 3 tells us that the world, everything in it, is going to be burned up and going to be destroyed. And so God created this world as a temporary place for us. Our real place is heaven. Uh, for Christians, we sometimes sing, sing the song, this world's not my home, I'm just a passing through. And that's the truth. Now, we get too attached to this world many times, I understand that, but it's a temporary place. Peter uses the language in second, or 1 Peter 2 that we're pilgrims and wanderers in this, in this world. Both of, those worlds, both of those words used in 1 Peter 2 to describe Christians basically describes people living in another country who don't really have citizenship in that country. Actually, the one phrase used there really is re used in reference almost to an illegal alien. We know what that is, the discussion in our country concerning people here illegally. In one sense of the word, uh, we're, we're here, of course, legally by God, but we're unwanted by the world, so to speak, and sort of cast off by the world. But our real citizenship is in heaven. That's where our real home is. Having said that, then what's not going to occur when Jesus returns? You know, we hear a lot of talk today about... Um, the Middle East and things going on uh, in the Middle East. And many people teach that somehow this is all a matter of Bible prophecy and what's taking place in the Middle East is we're just waiting for the, the imminent return of Jesus. And then when Jesus does return, that somehow he's going to sit down on a literal throne in Jerusalem and, and rule over a, a literal kingdom for a thousand years uh, in Palestine and that somehow uh, this millennial you know, reign will begin. Well, the one, among other problems, we call this doctrine premillennialism, pre meaning before, millennial meaning a thousand year reign, but the, at the heart of premillennialism is the fact that the kingdom's already here. You know, premillennialists are still looking for a future kingdom to be set up, but the kingdom already is here. In the ministry of both Jesus and John the Baptist, the, the kingdom of God was very near. John the Baptist, Matthew 3, 2, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Matthew 4, 17, Jesus had the same message, repent for the, uh, excuse me, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We find in Mark 9, 1, Jesus told his apostles there were some standing there at that time who would not die until they saw the kingdom come with power. So Jesus himself promised the kingdom will be established in his lifetime. Matthew 16, 18 and 19, Jesus said, after Peter, or Peter confessed him as the son of God, he said, upon this rock I'll build my church, the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. None to you I'll give the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And so the words church and kingdom are used interchangeably by Jesus. And we find the church beginning in Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, the church began when Peter preached the gospel. People turned to, uh, turned to Christ, believing it was the Son of God, turning from their sins. They were baptized for the remission of their sins. But in that sermon that Peter was preaching in Acts chapter 2, he made the point that Jesus was presently reigning in a kingdom. Acts chapter 2 uh, as we, we look to the reference here, verses 30 and 31, Therefore, being a prophet and knowing that God has sworn with an oath to him of that fruit of his body, talking here about a prophecy of David, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He foreseeing this spoke concerning the resurrection of the Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. The kingdom was prophesied of in Old Testament times that it was going to be uh, set up in the days of the Roman Empire in Jerusalem, also, there are going to be events tied into it with the outpouring of the Holy Spirit and so forth. Also, it was near during the, the lifetime of Jesus and John the Baptist. And in Acts chapter 2, following the resurrection of Jesus from the dead, Peter says this, David had a prophecy in the Psalms that God wasn't going to allow Christ to remain in the Hadean realm. Christ, of course, was three days in the grave in the Hadean realm. And God said, I'm not going to allow your soul to re re remain there, but you're going to come out of Hades. And that basically is a statement that when he came out of Hades, he began to reign. 
So Christ is reigning now over his, over his kingdom, over his church, as is mentioned in verse 30 of Acts chapter 2, the idea that Jesus would be sitting on his throne. And so we do have a Lord right now. We have a king. He's Jesus. We presently have a kingdom, that being the church. And what happens, 1 Corinthians 15, 24, talking about when Jesus returns, at that time he actually delivers the kingdom to the Father. And so there's just a tremendous amount of speculation in the doctrine of premillennialism, which very simply is not taught in Scripture. There are so many Old Testament prophecies which point to the fact of the establishment of the kingdom, the church, the fact that it was established in Acts chapter 2. And the kingdom's a present reality in New Testament times. We find from the Colossians, the first chapter, that Paul said those Christians in verse 13 have been taken out of the realm or kingdom of Satan and translated into the kingdom of God's near, dear son. 2,000 years ago, there were people in the city of Colossae who already were in that kingdom. In Revelation, the first chapter, John's writing from the Isle of Patmos, and he mentions in verse 9 that he's in the kingdom. So again, the kingdom already is here. Jesus is Lord. He's ruling over that kingdom. And we shouldn't look for a future uh, material kingdom of Jesus here on earth. Again, from the time I was little, I, I've always had an interest in religious things, and, and especially in the doctrine of, of the end times. I can remember uh, as perhaps even junior high age, a teenager, remembering different people talking about the return of Jesus being very imminent because of the events in the Middle East. I can remember back, and I believe it was 1967, uh, or 667, I think, it was a six-day war between Egypt and Israel. This is a sign of the end. This is a sign of the establishment of the kingdom of God. It's going to take place very soon in Israel. Later on, I can remember uh, uh, some other events taking place in the Middle East with Iran. And then, of course, the first Gulf, Gulf War. And, uh, you know, there, Jesus is coming back very soon. The second Gulf War. And we go on and on. And now we have the, the present discussion concerning Iran and, and its nuclear threat and things of that nature. And all kinds of stuff tied into the Middle East. And you can turn on your television or radio and you'll find preachers very confidently asserting that they know the end's very near because the kingdom's going to be established and Jesus will return. Well, Jesus is returning, but we don't know when that's going to happen. And also, he's not going to return to establish a kingdom. It's already here. So what will happen then when Jesus does return? What are the events of that day? Again, he's going to be returning the clouds. He, the dead in Christ will be raised first. All will be judged. And then it will be everlasting death or life. With that in mind, how can we prepare for the judgment? The idea that we all are going to stand one day before God in judgment and give an answer for our, for our lives. First of all, we need to have faith. We need to truly believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He paid uh, the price on the cross for our sins. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, He who knew no sin uh, basically became sin for us. He was our sin sacrifice. He was that, that Lamb of God which takes away our sin. So basically, we need to believe that Jesus truly was and was God's Son. Second, we need to repent, and, and the Bible word repent basically talks about turning, changing direction, understanding how bad sin is, turning from sin, and turning toward God. Obviously, none of us are ever perfect in this realm, but in order to obey Christ, we need to turn from sin and turn to God. And of course, repentance isn't something that's just done before we obey the gospel. It's an ongoing responsibility as a Christian. And also the need to confess Christ as the Son of God, the idea that we truly believe He is God's Son. And again, that's something that not only should be done before we become a Christian, but it's an ongoing thing in our Christian lives. And then, of course, to be baptized for the remission of our sins. Acts 2.38, baptism is listed as being for the forgiveness of sins. When Peter established there, when the church was established, when Peter gave what we sometimes refer to as, as, as the plan of the church as far as entrance into the church, which, of course, is the kingdom. And after we're baptized, we're a Christian, and we need to walk uh, that new life. We need continued faithfulness. We talk about faithfulness. We're not talking about sinless perfection, but we're talking about people who basically are trying to follow God in their lives to the best of their ability. And when we do that, we can have the assurance that we will stand justified in the judgment. Jesus is coming back, and obviously we need to be, need to be prepared for that judgment. Before we close our program today, we'd like to take a moment and review this roadmap to heaven with you since the matter is so serious. There are many incorrect set of directions out there and sadly so many people are following them. For example, some people have been given wrong turns. They believe things such as faith only, works only, or grace only. Or some attempt to change the order of the turns, being baptized before they even believe. Some people fail to realize what point they are on the map. 
don't even open their Bibles yet and they think they're saved already. As a person travels in a car or takes a hike, has to follow the proper directions, so we must follow the proper directions to heaven. Let's take a look at the directions on our roadmap to heaven here. You have to look at these passages in your Bible for yourself. We'll just list the steps, the turns on the way. First is to believe or to have faith. And then number two, to repent, to turn away from sin. Number three is to confess that Jesus is the Son of God. Number four is immersion or to be baptized, which is a burial in water to have your sins washed away. And then you're added to the church by the Lord, not by a group of people or not by giving some kind of testimonial experience or things like that. And then once you're added, you need to serve and worship the Lord faithfully all the days of your life. And, that, and the key word's faithfully. You don't waver. And that's very important. We need to keep in mind, too, that in Noah's day, there was a big flood, and only people in the ark were saved from the flood. The same is true today. There is no salvation outside the Lord's church. Where are you on the road map to heaven? Thanks for watching our program. Please let us know if we can assist you with further information for your journey.